video feedback device has reached its final iteration. I've said that before, but I think I've achieved perfection. This will be a description of what it does and a history of its evolution. The device is constructed of maple and mahogany wood. This mahogany strip is not inlaid, but a piece of mahogany is sandwiched between two pieces of maple, and then the pieces were glued together. To make the curved pieces, like the arch here, or the arms that hold the viewing monitors, these sandwiches of maple and mahogany were cut out using a CNC router. That's computer numerical control, and this technology has been around since the 50s. The legs are also a maple mahogany sandwich, glued together, then cut with this fancy miter gauge to get the angles just right. And the 4x4s were also made by gluing pieces of maple together. All the wood was bought rough cut, which is a much cheaper way to go, and then put through the jointer and the planer. A non-computer controlled router was used to make the dovetails for the box that holds the front rotating monitor. For the finish I used shellac flakes dissolved in 190 proof food grade alcohol. Shellac comes from the little lac bug in India. They live on trees and eat the sap and secrete this sticky resin. So it's only appropriate that it goes back onto wood. It's been used as a finish for thousands of years and is also used in the candy industry as a coating. It's completely edible, so feel free to lick the device all you want without worrying about toxic chemicals. It's been one year since I first started this maple mahogany build of the device. And originally I had wooden dowels going through aluminum tubes. This was an aesthetic improvement over the wooden dowels going through PVC tubing of the previous iterations. But I was never satisfied with the ease of movement of the dowels through the tubes. It just was not smooth enough and tend to be kind of sticky. It also required a lot of lubrication, which could get gooey and gloopy and pretty messy. Recently I replaced the wooden dowels with these hardened anodized aluminum shafts. And I was using these iGlide plastic bearings. There was a huge improvement from before. The movement was just so much smoother, but it wasn't perfect. From a standstill, there was a little bit of a stick to get it moving. And when you're doing video feedback, that's definitely something you don't want. I knew that linear bearings with metal ball bearings would be a lot smoother, but the question was how do you do linear motion and rotational motion at the same time with a linear bearing? Also, linear bearings can be really expensive. After a lot of experimenting, I came up with an idea, and I found someone on eBay selling a lot of four of them, exactly how many I needed, for just $99. These are genuine German Ninja Kugelagers. These work by recirculating metal ball bearings along the track. These kind of bearings are always in some kind of housing, but a big industrial housing like this wasn't going to work for me. Without the housing putting just the right amount of pressure around the outside of the bearing, the metal shaft can rotate within the bearing, but not in a very good way, it kind of rattles around. With the housing, the shaft moves even better back and forth than without the housing, but the shaft can no longer spin within the bearing. So how was I going to get the metal shaft to rotate and also be able to move back and forth? I came up with the idea of using a rotational bearing around the linear bearing, so the rotational bearing acts as the housing, putting just the right amount of pressure so that the shaft can't spin, but does move very smoothly back and forth. Then the linear bearing spins with inside the rotational bearing. Has this ever been done before? There was a small amount of stickiness because the outer seal on the linear bearings made a bit of contact with the metal shaft. I removed these and sanded them down, put them back on, and then the sliding was amazingly smooth. And the rotation was extremely easy. In fact, too easy. Just the weight of this cable to the monitor rotated the shafts. It's nice that they spun so freely, but I'd like to be able to let go of the handle and not have anything move. And that's what brings me to what transfers the linear motion of these shafts. In the original iterations of the device, I used a rubber Van de Graaff generator belt to transfer the rotation, and small pieces of PVC tubing with either screws or tape on either side to catch the motion to transfer the linear motion of one rod to the other. This worked, but there was a dead zone, a bit of hesitation when you moved one rod before the other rod started moving. For this maple mahogany build of the device, I switched from the Van de Graaff belt to using these pulleys and a V-belt like you would use in your car. And I replaced the small PVC parts with these CNC cut mahogany parts with these metal pieces on both sides to catch the motion. 
but there was still a bit of a lag from when you moved one rod to when the other rod moved. You could reduce the lag by moving these metal parts closer into the wooden donuts here, but the more you did that, the more friction there was, making it harder and harder to turn. Now, with the aluminum shafts, I've completely removed this problem by using rotational bearings with pieces of metal between them. Now the shafts can move very freely around and still catch the movement back and forth with zero lag. I have this set up on both the front and the back of the device, and the improvement is amazing. But this brings me back to there's not enough friction, and I fixed that by putting a thicker grease into these rotational bearings. I use this very sticky grease called NioGel. This makes it so it's still very easy to rotate, but there's just the perfect amount of dampening, so when you let go, things don't move on their own. Also, to help with the wires going to this monitor rotating things, I swapped out the heavy control module cable with enamel wires, 10 enamel wires, twisted together. The camera mounts have also been updated, and instead of being made of wood, they're sleeker, made of aluminum. And there's play in the mounting holes, so that the mount can be slid up and down on the shaft, and the camera can be slid left and right on the mount, so that the center of the lens can be lined up exactly with the center of the shaft. The cameras are also hardwired for power, so batteries going dead are not an issue. I'm using the A7S III now on the left side with much improved autofocus. The older A7 III with worse autofocus is still on the right side, but maybe one day that'll change? It's important to be able to change the relative rotation of the cameras to each other. For instance, to be able to have one camera at 90 degrees while the other one is at 180 degrees. These V-belts are designed not to slip within the grooves of the pulley. Actually, they're called sheaves and that would make it very hard to change the relative rotation of the cameras. But by putting a little bit of grease on the belt, it is possible to rotate one shaft while keeping the other one still, so the rotation of one camera can change while the other one does not move. But you might be thinking, what does this thing do? This creates extremely controlled video feedback. Video feedback is what happens when you point a camera at a monitor displaying what the camera is seeing. This is like audio feedback, where a microphone picks up the sound the speaker is making in very quick cycles, creating a screeching sound. The video feedback is the same thing, except instead of creating sound, it creates light. I started experimenting with video feedback in college in 1988. I put a camera on a tripod, pointed it at my TV screen, and played around with the hue and contrast saturation brightness knobs. And you do need to have these knobs to do video feedback, otherwise there's just no controlling it. Even older cathode ray tube standard definition televisions stopped using these analog knobs sometime around the 90s. And to control these functions like brightness and contrast, you would use the menu, which doesn't work for video feedback because you really need your hands on these knobs, plus the menu would come up and interfere with the feedback. And so when I worked at a guest house in 2003 on Cape Cod and the room I was staying in did have an old TV with these knobs, I thought I could make some video feedback. But how can I control the camera much more precisely than just putting it on a tripod? And I came up with this idea of mounting the camera on a rod going through a tube. But I always thought it would be great to have the knobs up front where you can move the camera and also control the knobs at the same time. And years later I wanted to do this in HD, but it's really hard to find HD screens that have analog knobs. And it wasn't until 2020 when I discovered Panasonic field monitors that I could make this project possible. These monitors were designed to be used on set during production, and when they first came out maybe a decade ago or so, they were a few thousand dollars. But now you can get them on eBay for a couple hundred. And the great thing about these is they have a separate control module with these analog knobs. So all I had to do is extend the cable to bring those knobs forward so I can control them as I move the camera. I also wanted to not just make video feedback, but make video feedback fractals. And I knew you could do this using a mirror in front of the screen, but I thought there might be a better way of doing this. And I found this post from 1997 from Peter King on Sweet and Fizzy. This uses a piece of glass at a 45 degree angle between two monitors. I used this method and the 2020 iteration of the device has just one camera and the two HD monitors at right angles to each other with a sheet of 50-50 teleprompter glass between them. This allows 50% of the light from the back monitor to go through the glass, and 50% of the light from the bottom monitor to be reflected in the glass. These two images combine with each other and create video feedback fractals. Some very organic shapes. Shapes found in nature, trees and leaves. And since then, the device has evolved. 
a switcher was added so another input from the phone could be used to influence the feedback. Then to give this second input some motion, a second rod linked to the first and a second camera was added. And to be able to have this second input itself go into feedback and have that feedback loop influence the first feedback loop, a second switcher was added and a third HD Panasonic field monitor. Then a complete second monitor structure was added. And to make room for two of them, I constructed them out of T-slot aluminum. Then the third switcher was added so there can be a feedback loop between the monitor structures themselves. And then in the front, a rotating Panasonic field monitor and the third camera. Then I added the fourth switcher. The switches between the phone as an input and the third camera looking at the rotating monitor as the input. So here's the device. 20 years after the idea of a camera mounted on a stick going through a tube. Each monitor on the top can be raised up and down, and the position of these monitors affects the patterns being made. And the lower monitors can be slid back and forth, and they can also be rotated 180 degrees. The monitor control modules are here. This is where you change the hue, brightness, saturation, and contrast for each one of the monitors. The rotating front monitor's control module is here. Each monitor has two inputs being used and you also use the control module to set those inputs. Input 1 on each monitor will see a camera directly. Input 2 will see one of the various switchers, and the switcher has the option of either seeing the camera or seeing something else. This allows something else to be mixed in with the feedback. Each one of the switchers uses one of these buttons to switch between the camera input and another input. You can also use these foot pedals to do the same thing. Switcher 1 switches between the output of the camera on the left and the output of what's happening on the right monitor structure. Switcher 2 switches between the output of the camera on the right and the output of switcher 3. Switcher 3 switches between the output of what's happening on the left monitor structure and the output of switcher 4. And switcher 4 switches between the output of the phone and the output of the front camera, which is looking at the rotating monitor. As you might imagine, there are a lot of wires, converters, splitters, power cords, making this all happen. And that's all hidden inside the platform. And the maple slats can be removed and the two halves of the platform folded up with everything remaining connected so things don't have to be rewired when the device is moved from place to place. So you might not have caught this, but in all these permutations and combinations, there's a setting where the output of the monitor structure on the left is seen on the monitor structure on the right, and the output of the monitor structure on the right is seen on the monitor structure on the left. And this creates a feedback loop between both monitor structures creating a sort of an infinite within the infinite. I can demonstrate a very simple version of this by turning down the lower monitors and putting the device in this configuration. And here you see what I'm doing on the right side can be seen on the left side. And what I'm doing on the left side can be seen on the right side. But things can be made even more complicated. Here I've turned up the lower monitors and changed the position of the monitors a bit. And so now you have one shape on one side and one shape on the other. But really what's happening is one shape is making the other while the other is making the first. And you can see what I'm doing on one screen affects the others, and what I'm doing on the other screen affects all the others, and the other screen affects all the others, and the fourth screen also affects all the others. So now each setting on each monitor affects everything else. This can get out of hand really quickly, but when controlled just right, some amazing and surprising things can happen. And so I kind of lied when I said that this is finished because someday I would like to have this all done in 4K because just like going from standard definition to HD was an amazing jump, the intricacy of the patterns going from HD to 4K I think would be just as amazing. Unfortunately, it's just not possible to do this in 4K because you need monitors with those knobs and there really aren't 4K monitors with analog knobs. If someone knows where to find something like this, let me know.